Professor G.F. Korek from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Lived here pretty much my entire life, except for when I went to Michigan State University. I was there for four years, and back here. Uh, it goes back to when I was a little kid, when I had the measles. Uh, back in that day, we still had phonics, which I still argue in favor of, but just because of the word sounds. And there were certain words that I would, you put the sounds together, and I couldn't do it. It was frustrating me, like, why does this make this sound? Why does it make that sound? I was home by myself, because my mom had to work that day. And I finally got it, and it was like a light bulb went off. And it wasn't like I started writing poetry right away, but I started playing with words from, from that point on. And then in elementary school, everybody at that era, at that time, was taught Emily Dickinson because everything she wrote was iambic pentameter and it was easy to break it apart. And this is a simile, this is a metaphor, blah, blah, blah. They just, it's amazing to look at her now and she's just an incredible poet, but nobody got that sense because it was all this sing-song stuff and breaking things apart. So I thought, you know, I actually like her stuff. Then when I got into high school, it was other people, the typical stuff like E.E. E. Cummings and Dylan Thomas, that kind of stuff. So. That's how I got started. Well, Thomas, I, I heard read, and there's something about him reading there. There's so much energy in it, but just in the language that he used too, the way he'd, he'd come out with the language, like light breaks for no sun shines and that kind of thing. And Cummings, it was, a lot of it was topographical, but a lot of it was him reading too. It was just funny that he could take something and twist it, and if you paid attention, it made sense. So I thought, I could do that with words. And a lot of it was I couldn't speak to anybody. I was terminally shy, but I could write and I could communicate that way. So those are the two guys that, that really did it for me. Well, you have the TH, PH, those kind of things, silent Gs, those kinds of words. That I didn't realize that our language could do so many different things. It never occurred to me, like, this is how you spell this word, this is how this word is supposed to sound, and then you'd look at it and you'd think, like a word like through, for example. How is through spelled like that? <laughs> but to me that was magical because I could invent words. I could invent sounds, which is one of the things that Cummings did with a lot of his work. He did he create sounds with his poetry. That to, that to me was just a marvel because I didn't have any musical talent. My grandparents had an organ and had one of those little guides. You could, this is a C, this is a C sharp, and you press one key and make a song. That's, that was the extent of what I could do. But with poetry, I could do anything, so. I still look for sounds or still listen for sounds that I hear. You hear his tires, tires screech. Well, I mentioned the siren a minute ago. There's also, it's like they're a sign of something to me. Um, it does find itself into a lot of, of what I do, because I try, the sound will trigger something. Like I started writing a, a sequence or a series of poems based on what's happening in Ukraine. It just started getting to me. And the sounds are unavoidable. You hear the noise, the explosions and all that, but there's, what's happening while that's going on? What's the aftermath of that? What did that trigger? So there's other things going on. And it's, it's how the words are arranged, too, that make a difference. You can say something, you just say, this is how it goes, and everybody writes it that way. But what if you transpose a word here or there? You get a different sound, but you also get a different meaning. You just want people to stop, to pause, and look at it a different way, to reflect on it a different way. Kind of, well, I'm kind of an iconoclast, you know. I, when I was at JC, uh, I met a guy named David Montgomery, who's in the, in the book. And there was a teacher named Marina Sweats, who pretty much put us together. I think he figured we were kindred spirits, because we were both kind of loners and quiet. And he had stopped driving at that point. Uh, as it turned out, he, had, he, he was a severe manic depressive, which is astonishing to me that he could do any of the things he did. He was just an incredible human being. But I gave him rides to school every day. So he became close friends. Well, he wrote, so I wanted to write. And then Frank Salomone, one of the other guys in the book, 
played guitar and wrote poetry, and he'd win the poetry contests every year. And, uh, Culp had won the year before. I met Culp a little bit later, but I wanted to be like those guys. So that's when I started trying to write, and I finally got a poem published. In fact, the first poem I had in the Dyer Ives contest, X.J. Kennedy was the judge. And I think Frank and I tied for second place with somebody else. And Kennedy wrote, just, I just couldn't give this poem a first place. It's too derivative. And then he said, this guy looks like he's the kind of guy who'd write one good poem in a lifetime. <laughs> I thought, gee, thanks a lot. So uh, that was my introduction to being a published poet. We did readings at junior college because of the there was a poetry class, so every year the class had a reading upstairs with the music department. And then the first, the first festivals were actually on Wealthy Street. There was a little tiny art museum there, a little white building that's still there. And then they, did, they had the festival there. They decided they're going to move it to the Calder. I think that was 68 or 69. They had the first one. So I read it the first two. I was in a group of people who were asked to read at those. And that was a lot of fun. I mean, people actually wanted to hear. And they paid attention, they applauded. It. This is cool, this is different. I remember Culp was there once. Uh, his wife Susie Culp read one time. I think there was James Allen who was, was there once. But we had a, like a 10 or 15 minute time period to read in, which is pretty incredible. And I think early on, I don't remember if this was the Dyer Eyes winners or not. I know at one point the winners got to read. Then the press also had their own writing contest for prose and poetry, mostly prose, and those people read too. But I realized that was an exhilarating experience to read. Because you know, I'm not a good I wasn't playing a guitar or anything else, but people were paying attention. Just the fact that people were paying attention to something got me excited. And then when I went to Jace, to uh, Michigan State, we'd had readings here and there. And that was fun too. In one of the interviews with Kid Kane, she's just speaking extemporaneously. She's talking about connecting. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't quite understand, I do and I don't understand, well, I understand the difference between performance and slam. Maybe it's slight, but it, I see, I do see a difference. What I, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, I'm sorry, but the slam to me is a lot like some of the early rap. It's like, I'm better than you. I thought, well, okay, cool. But that's not, to me, that's not what it's about. And today, a lot of the performance stuff, I don't know, did you interview Azizi Jaspers? Was he? Yeah, yeah okay. He does performance poetry. I was his soccer coach when he was a little kid, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But I like what he does, because he's, he's making connections with people. He's not bragging about how cool he is. And that's different to me. I forgot where I started out with this. Oh, about writing, getting people to react. There's a poem by William Stafford called A Ritual to Read to Each Other. And the last line is something about how awake people have to be awake because the darkness around us is deep. So it's not just that, yeah, you write, but you write, you read it to each other because you want to make that connection through poetry. But the awakeness is also what matters. I'm more of an iconoclast, so part of my connection had to do with when they had the, the poetry workshop that Cope presented. And you have the book for that. I think, what was that, 2012? Somewhere around in there. 2011. But um, that got me. I was able to meet a lot of different people through that. And then there'd be readings at different places, not always where I read necessarily, but Aquinas College had the uh, Linda Nemec Foster and her husband Tony put this on for, for years. I got to meet some of those people, like Gregory Orr and I didn't meet Naomi Nye, but I had a connection with her later on. So that's been, I'm more on the periphery of a lot of that stuff, which is okay. And then I've done readings here and there, like uh, there's a children's network. 
I did a reading at Harmony House, I think I mentioned that. Then I did one at Blanford, which was interesting because people are just walking by. Would you like to hear a poem? Some did, some didn't. But again, that's, you know, I like that experience. So there are all sorts of opportunities, I guess. You know, this is one of them too. But I mean, just, it's hard to not find something. Uh, there, there have been readings at the library from time to time. I participated in a couple of those, so. It's, uh, well, I think it has to go, like I said, from my, my reticence from when I was younger. I didn't want to, so do I dare put this out there? What if people don't like it? That kind of thing, it's a typical shy person. But as I got older, I wasn't sure that people would want to read what I had to write. Like I said, I look at someone like uh, Kid Kane and a lot of the poets around today, they're very, at least they come off as self-assured. And I know she talks about being vulnerable and that's what it's about. It's, a, it's a really a different era. So my iconoclast personality comes from being uncertain about what I'm writing, is it worth putting out there? And it's only been only recent that I started putting things on the internet. I thought, I don't care if it gets published. I mean, it's published there. If people react to it, like I've done about 10 or 12 now since things started in Ukraine, and I get reactions. But what I really want to do is, is get people reacting among each other about it, get them talking about it, keep them thinking about it. So I guess to answer the, que the initial question is that I didn't think what I was doing was, was worth showing to people or that even poetry was, was worth doing. It's kind of, that's ah, just a silly thing. No one wants to read this stuff. And as I got older, I thought, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Some will respond to it. You look at the inauguration last year, for example, the young person who read. I'm not judging the, the con. well, yeah, I'm judging the content somewhat, but people responded, just like they respond to music. And I think that's something that seems to me to be changing with poetry, which is a good thing. Well, and the idea is that people don't hear it. I thought, thinking always, you know, just, just listen to it. Don't try to figure out what it's about. It's like when Frank played music, for example, he, he wrote a lot of songs and people would say, I can't play it like you do. And I said, he'd say, good, make it your own. I think that's what happens with a poem. That it's not like there's one meaning to it. Sometimes you write things and you probably have had that experience. Where did this come from? Well, it's out there now. We'll see what happens with it. Uh, it doesn't matter to me if people interpret a poem differently than how I saw it. If it resonates with them, that's what's important. That, to me, that's the idea of, of doing it in the first place. Uh, I go back to that, the Stafford poem is that awake people have to be awake. You have to stir them awake sometimes. You have to wake them up. Um, people can be yelled at. They can be involved in something really uh, violent. But if they hear something that catches their ear, even their eye, if they're reading it, just that, that to me is what its purpose is. It, there's a line, um, when I started doing my little poems for the Ukraine, there's a passage from a poem that Auden wrote. It was an elegy for Yeats. And there's a line in there that says, for poetry makes nothing happen. Then he goes on to talk about how it does make things happen because it makes people aware of what's happening around them. And that's not an easy thing to do. Like I say, I used to sit there in the dark and I liked doing it because I figured the entire world's asleep. Now I can do what I want to do. But a lot of the things that had been on my mind during the day or even weeks prior would, would come to the fore and I'd start putting them down. I started carrying, I can show you my, my poetry notebook. I think this is it. <laughs> I actually write little, almost aphoristic things. Like a lot of the Ukraine stuff has been that way. I'm, I'm waiting for, for an appointment for something and I'll just pull that out and start writing. Instead of reading a dental magazine or something, I'll pull that out. 
and uh, have you inter are you interviewing Mursalata Muhammad? Okay, she used to do, I don't know, she probably still does. She does stuff on her telephone. In fact, she did a whole sequence of poems on her telephone. That was her notebook. I'm not that adept with, with uh, my fingers are too fat, and I'm, if they, uh, I'll hit a letter or something and everything will disappear, so I have this. But it's been, it's useful. Plus, if somebody tells me something, if they tell me about a book or someone I read, then I write that down. So it's really, it's really useful, because I'll have to half asleep some night, I'll, I'll look at that and, oh, I meant to read this person, or I meant to get that book, so it's been great. So I'm sitting in the parking lot at Mercy Health. I'm looking down and there's this pile of cement that had hardened. I was looking at the shapes in the cement. And it looked like a mother with a child, and then there was a heart above that that was breaking, and all that, that conjured up all these images. And it didn't amount to a great poem, but I thought there's something there. And what that told me, though, there's a couple things that I remember. One was a government teacher I had in high school. This woman who retired, so she would have been, I mean, she'd be a hundred and something now if she was still around. But she said, when you take notes, don't worry about what they look like. Just get them down. You can go look at them later, but get it all down. And the other one was uh, Stafford, again, who talked about you have to realize that 90% of the poems you write are gonna, you're going to throw away, but you have to write them. So those, I, look at, I listen to those two things when I write. Like I don't know if this is going to be whatever good is, or if I like it or keep it. But I ha if I don't do it, I won't get to the other stuff. And sometimes, you know, that little poem with the, maybe that poem in the parking lot doesn't amount to anything now, but maybe I'll use a piece of it for something else sometime later. And it's just the fact that I notice that, or I notice people talking. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can remember when uh, I was at JC, I think Jim Allen had just started working at Allen's bookstore. I don't remember the guys, and there was an old guy with white hair who was kind of irritable. <laughs> it was, he ran the books. It was a huge place. Jim Allen read it, read it and he, uh, of course, he was a writer, and he'd talk a lot about it. Uh, I mentioned the people that I knew at JC who wrote. And then John Hunting used to come and hang around what they called it the Collegiate Office. It's part of uh, Kendall now, that building. He'd just come and sit and listen to people. He wasn't that much older than, than we were. He just liked being there. And then at some point, probably, well, 67, 68, it was decided that they were going to endow a competition. And I saw the first book, The Broken River Blues, and I thought, man, it'd be cool to be part of this. And the next year, when it came up again, I was trying to write, and they were trying to find ways to promote it. And my neighbor was, actually worked for a radio station, so I remember taking the flyer to him, and he said he'd promote it on air. So that was my first connection with it. And then when I actually got a poem that was considered for it, that was like, it was just a great thing. I mean, between that and festival, I think, it's not like things took off in Grand Rapids, but the acknowledgement that this was worth doing, that it was important enough, that it warranted attention, was a big deal. And I think some of the other people started together. I don't remember who taught at, at uh, well, there's a guy named Herbert Martin who taught at Aquinas. I don't remember who was teaching at Calvin. And there was a guy that I know now named Jack Riddle who came to Hope in the late 1900s, 1990s. Oh, you knew him too? Yeah. I take his workshop now, so. Between he and Culp, he's one of the, they're one of the reasons I still do what I do. So, yeah, I think that the Dyer Eyes was a key element of, of keeping poet, not just keeping it, but awakening it, if you will, in Grand Rapids. Yeah, I didn't even know who he was. He'd have this rumpled suit and he'd come and drink coffee. I mean, just a bunch, of, we'd hang around and talk every morning. Somebody said, well, that's John Hunting. And I, okay, whoever that is. 
I didn't know anything about his background. And, I mean, I do now, but I didn't. Um, but that was a pretty cool place back in that era, too. The teachers were really supportive. You know, Lockwood, Sweats, uh, a guy named Bill Dix, uh, Lucy DeLoof, who was kind of like a gypsy woman, almost. She taught poetry. Uh, there was another woman named Elaine Clark. And she told me something about, uh, yeah, it's all well and good to write this stuff, but you had to be getting paid for it. <laughs> it's okay. And I don't think it's something you go into to make money. I suppose I can't deny that I've gone into it now, not to get recognition, although it would certainly be nice, but I almost never send out anything. I keep mentioning the collegiate office. If you go to that building where Kendall is now, you go in that side door off Fountain Street, you went down the hall about 20 feet. There was this big office with these old beat up tables and chairs in it. And there was a bookshelf and then in between the two bookshelves, Lockwood was on one side and Sweats on the other. So he had the English department and the student newspaper in the same place. So a lot of us would spend almost all day there. So we didn't know what was going on in the rest of the school, necessarily. Well, the art department was reasonably active. And then Fred Sobolski came and energized you know, playwriting and performance. So that helped too. So yeah, I guess. Compared to everywhere else, it might have been a Mecca, but it, it, it embraced these people. It certainly did that. And it felt like you were valid being there. So yeah, and most of the English teachers liked, they didn't say they didn't like what we did. They just encouraged us to do it. Plus that office was a place where you got a, a wide range of opinions, which was also fun because there were some really conservative people in, in the political science department. Uh, the science people had their own ideas about the origin of species and all that they'd come in and start to argue about. But, but they were the kind of arguments where people laugh at each other. I thought, you don't have that much today. Okay, I'm trying to remember how I learned about that, but there was, I don't remember his last name. His first name was Lee. I'm trying to remember Lee's last name. This goes back to the 80s. I was in a writer's group and word got out that you were, that people were doing readings. Uh, you just, you call them up and you say, I want to do this and they'd schedule you. And they were all live, which was pretty cool. So you'd go to, in fact, their radio station was on Kalamazoo and 28th Street at one point before it moved. So we'd show up, he'd introduce us. We'd do our, I think we had 15 minutes. I mean, I read some stories too, but I read a lot of poetry. And that was it. That was, I don't know, I must have done that about a dozen times. I have some of them recorded. Uh, I took Montgomery with me a couple times. There was one poem that I wrote that I had uh, Gene Bailey and Bill Holm read with me. We each had a section to read with it. And Lee left, and the person who took it over decided, no, they're going to record people doing this. And I, nah, I lost interest in it. I liked the fact that it was live. But it had gotten to a point where they actually had a, a sort of a festival of sorts at the end of one year. I don't remember where the place was now where they had this, but they had musicians. They had probably 15 or 20 readings. And they had a pretty decent crowd for it. At last, it was an all-day affair, which was pretty cool. I just liked the idea. It was, well, in the 60s, they called these happenings, I suppose. But I liked about it that it, was, it wasn't exactly impromptu, but it was open-ended. Going and recording something doesn't have the same attitude to it, in my opinion. It to me, it's right? a connection. It's, it's like, well, when you hear a live music album, you know, you're not there. But you hear the audience in the background. You, you get the sense that I could have been there. Yeah. So, I mean, the poetry, to me, having it live has that same feeling to me, even though there's not anyone sitting out there listening. Every now and then I'll come up, somebody will say, I heard you read, and I thought, I don't even know the person. So, I said, oh, yeah, I've been, I've been reading your stuff for years. And I thought, where? <laughs> so they must have heard that or they'd heard it at festival years ago. So 
that's kind of a cool thing when somebody acknowledges that. Yeah. Plus, they're people you wouldn't expect. There's a guy who's a little older than me who um, I used to work with years ago. I worked at the Grand Rapids Press. I was not a writer. I worked in the circulation department. We'd answer the telephones and little kids, I didn't get enough papers today. There was a guy who was a, a, man, a district manager, and he was a nice guy. And I saw him like five or six years ago. He said, yeah, I've been following your career. He said, you have? <laughs> okay, good. I think one of the things that Jack Riddle talks about, he's a big believer in the power of sentiment. And a lot of what I work borders on that. I'm not, and I don't mean this in a negative way either, but I'm not, I'm not that academic. I mean, if I use form, it's, it's more like muscle memory than oh, I think I'm going to use uh, this form or that form, or this is going to be an allegory. You know, yeah, it's not that I don't do those things. It's just that I'm not consciously, I'm not constructing something. I'm just letting it out. At the train station in Presmissile, their hands holding candles, thousands wait to meet loved ones for the first time. She lost a son in Crimea, but today she is serving tea in a plastic cup to a soldier and holding the cell phone for him as he talks to his mother back home. Well, these are all based on things that I've read about or seen on television, so I'm assuming, perhaps wrongly, that people might know what the, set, the scene is. Like that's one where this old woman was giving a Russian soldier, letting him use her phone so he could call his mom. Um, they seek refuge beneath the city. Their dreams remain above ground, waiting to dance again. A child in a pink parka tells everyone not to worry. There are no tears for this. There are not enough. And this is the first one, I, first little one I wrote. They're all short. When last seen alive, her embrace was shared with a dog she rescued. Today, the dog searches for what is left of her. So. That's powerful. So I'm trying to get people, well, I just want people to know how I feel, but I want them to feel something too. Like, this is the world we live in. Then I wrote some I called, uh, if I ever put the book together, it's going to be called Sleeping with the Pope. Because I had a dream one time. I wrote down the dream. It was a weird one. I'm actually walking on water in Lake Superior. And the Pope, well, I like the Pope they have now, Pope Francis. He comes riding in a white kayak to come and talk to me. And I said, okay, I don't know where this came from, but I'm writing it down. So I started making up a bunch of them that go with it. They all have the Pope in it. So this one's called Dream in a Minor Key. I find myself in the middle of someone else's nightmare, a pair of dark eyes floating outside a window when the Pope shows up and begins playing heart and soul on a toy piano. He looks up and smiles. It's not for you, he says, but you can still listen. I don't know if I have the original one here or not. Probably not. Oh, they got a little dark at times, just point blank. Tossing all night, no cool side to the pillow, troubled by what seems a rainstorm, but it's a hail of bullets. They keep missing me and hitting children playing in the street. The pulp walks into the middle of it, his hands raised. He says, please. But the bullets hit him too, and he explodes into the sky like fragments from a piano. Oh, this is the one, this is the one, the dream, before waking. I walked on water from Lake Michigan to the Sioux, where I met the Pope in his white kayak, blessing the freighters that sleep on the bottom of Superior. He says he hears singing, the clinking of mugs, that we all have to sing, because we have to, to be awake. So, those are the kind of things I've been doing lately. I haven't written a lot of longer poems. Usually they tend to be, my hope is that they're humorous. 
like I had this, I went to Catholic school and I had this idea once, or I, I, we were talking about heaven and hell and purgatory and all this stuff. And one of the nuns, and I don't remember which grade, was talking about going to limbo. And I thought, there's no way I'm getting to heaven, but maybe I could shoot for limbo. I might be able to get there. So anyway, about two or three years ago, I had this idea for a poem as a, in the waiting room of the afterlife. Because I always imagined limbo would be kind of like a dentist's office. You have this really boring tan paint on the walls and old magazines. So the poem is about what there was. It, it, what all the people sitting around, what they were doing, and it had the, you know, the, some of the chairs were broken and the magazines were old. And there was a stack of, uh, oh shoot, where are those newspapers you get at the checkout lane? National Enquirer. There was a stamp on those that said, all true. <laughs> anyway, that, that, was, that might have been a 60-line poem. And I wrote another one about a shark who, uh, it's been, I don't know if it's been disproven or not, but a few years ago there were some researchers came upon a shark, I think it was in the northern Atlantic, that they, that they thought was something like five or six hundred years old. So the poem is about, well, what, would this, what would a 600-year-old shark be thinking about? <laughs> what was its life like? So that was that poem. So it's just taking some little piece of history or something that was on my mind and stretching it out. So where does this go? I think empathy is important. There was, a, there was a critic named John Simon who died not too long ago. I didn't even know he was still alive. He was mainly a theater critic. Some, he did some art criticism, but he hated just about everything. And I saw this article when I was in college that he wrote about, it was an argument for elitism. His argument was that, well, almost everything that's being painted, sculpted, written, played is crap. And we need elitism so that we can get rid of all the crap. And I thought, Okay, I don't buy your, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't buy it. I think if you're looking at poetry, you look at Walt Whitman. <laughs> that's, he mined his own crap. I mean, that's, that's how he wrote. He didn't edit very much. But you look at what he left behind, and that's incredible stuff. So, I mean, and he was not well received during his lifetime. And I'm not saying that, that crap, uh, everybody should endorse that. I'm just saying that if people aren't doing that work, you never get to anything. You don't start out being an elitist. You don't start out playing piano concertos that no one else can play. You go through all the other stuff. And if nothing else, the grand spirit experiment that's America is all about falling on our face half the time in, ev in everything that we do. We make a lot of mistakes. If you don't have those mistakes, you don't get to the stuff that works. Well, I think part of the process is finding out why there are mistakes or, or what the mistakes lead to. Yeah, I think poetry has to have that process. I think, and plus I think elitism is people who don't want to acknowledge anything else. They, have, they live in their own little world, whether it's elitism via wealth, elitism via education, whatever it is. It's like they control intellectual property and there's no admittance. One of the things that discouraged me from writing and why I'd, I'd go through gaps of not writing, I'd look at books of poetry or I'd, I'd read about publishers or other authors and There'd be a school of thought, and I thought, oh, don't tell me about a school of thought. It was a school of fish, not a school of thought. I hated that stuff. Again, I could understand why people would like to come together and, and commune, but not to say, oh, maybe you've come across it if you've tried to play stuff. Don't send us any of this kind of work, you know. Send us only thing that's meaningful and this and that and the other thing. And I thought, okay, why send anything? Basically, you're saying you're going to reject it out of hand unless you know the person, which is probably not true, but that's, that's the impression that they give off. I like doing the KDL work, and 
I think this is the sixth year that I've done it because it's all young people. And it's, it's heartening and discouraging at the same time because they look at some of the things these kids are trying to work through, like they're eight or nine years old and the, the, the horrible things that they're dealing with in their lives. And I know they're not making it up. I mean, some kids make up stuff because they think this is what poetry is, but the other ones are just, but just the energy. You know, I try to write something about every, every one of them. Like I started out saying, uh, just pick the, te the top 10. And they didn't award it. There was no first prize or anything like that, just 10. The first time I did, I said, can I do 12? Said, okay. <laughs> and usually I get about 35 or 40 poems they, they call. And I try to give up at least a line or two on each one, because I think if people are make, making this effort, then they should have some attention for it and show that somebody reacted to it. They call it a competition. I don't know what else to call it. It's a program. But they've been doing it for a number of years. And they have a reading each spring. They used to sponsor other readings out there, in fact. I, I did one with Todd Kaneko a few years ago. And I think there were eight people there. <laughs> but they would do that from time to time. But they ran out of, well, we didn't get paid for it. But they had to pay people to work to be there that day and buy some food and refreshments. So they stopped doing that. But they still have the youth program. And I, I don't know how they set that up. I imagine, I think they have a poster in the library and the teachers in the various schools around there encourage their kids to do work. And I can tell if it's a project. I thought, don't, don't do that. I want to tell the teachers, just let them write. Because there'll be, there'll be a poem on why I like dogs or something. There'll be 18 of those. <laughs> it's not that they aren't, some of them are pretty good, but I thought, Give them more room, give them more space. This is the last poem in the, in the Sleeping of the Pope sequence. It's called Winged Mercy. I have fallen asleep and gone to seed on the forest floor. A squirrel gathers me up, carries me high into the branches of an ancient oak. The Pope is there, feeding the birds. He takes me from the squirrel, tosses me into the air. I am plucked by a host of butterflies who carry me to the stars. It's kind of how I'd like to go <laughs> if I have a choice. Either that or sliding into third base, one of those two.